Welcome back to Scorecast and it's question and answer number three, or Trez. <laughs> what language is that? That's French. Yes. And, um, bilingual day, you would have thought that looking <laughs> at it, would you? The very and managers of well If you English. have any future questions, put them in the comments below, but also at the same time, click subscribe so you don't miss uh, any of our other videos coming up. Excellent. So, Tim, would you like to hear the first question? Yes, please, question master. The first question is actually uh, immediately after last week's one about uh, what on earth is going on with Jacko's hair. <laughs> yeah. Is it, yeah, this is a good topic actually. Jacko's got quite a detailed hair history, which is available for all to see if you just Google David Jackson mullet <laughs> into, into your favourite web so, browser. Um, to quote a good friend of mine, um, Sam Raven, if he's watching, we used to talk about the idea of um, when you're in between hairstyles, you've just got to let her be. So I'm just currently letting her be. I'm not. We're all grown our hair because if you haven't, if you're not currently cutting it, it's growing. And if you make, if you have your hair cut, then obviously you've made this. Well, I haven't made that decision, so see, I, I've got a good question actually. It, I'm saying, it I'll, I'll pitch you. It's, it's a, a bit like so the opposite. A mullet is long at the business at the front, part of the back. It's like long. <laughs> this is more like a frullet, where it's it, it, it's a front mullet. Yeah. So, so just in light of so that I'm aware because. It, I'm not sure how I feel about the mullet making a reappearance. No, it's not. No. What are you transitioning towards? I don't know. That's what I mean. I'm just letting it be. All right. Let it be. Not a man bun. Let's move on to a. I would be lying if I'd say it has never been in a ponytail. <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> anyway, so the first question. We're getting some good questions in now. Yes. Thanks for saying not those. Not the other ones were before weren't good. The good ones. Um, so the master Masterio Fiegel uh, on this was from YouTube. He says hi. Nice video. So thanks. Thanks. Um, he would like to know how to make a plan for learning a new skill, um, things he would need to consider and he was after, or an example he gave was if he wanted to learn the pistol squat. Okay. So Tim, can you kick us off with that please? Yeah, so the skill acquisition is a really detailed, quite complex subject, so we're going to just try and break it down into some simple terms, because people have literally written like textbooks about this, it involves a neural system which is pretty complicated in itself and just to get our heads around so we'll, we'll, we'll keep it in terms of what's actually going to make a difference in the gym so there's a couple of things about learning a new skill it, it doesn't matter if it's a pistol squat or you're playing the piano or you want to ride a bike or anything like that you're going to have to go through a process of teaching yourself how to move in the way or how to conduct movement in a way which is going to mean that you can do that particular thing yeah. and that involves you having to develop new potentially new or refining existing neural pathways to be able to do that so the central nervous system communicates with the, with the muscles around the body through the neural system, telling them how to move, when to activate, the, the level of activation, all that kind of stuff, and the integration between the muscles. So let's take, the, let's take a handstand because it's a bit more skill-based than a pistol squat. We'll, we'll come on to why in a minute. When you've never balanced on your hands before, having to learn to do that means that you're going to have to practice it so that your brain can start to learn those neural pathways. Now then we get something which is called myelination, which is basically an increase in a fatty substance which, you, which surrounds the neurons, and that helps the thicker that neuron, uh, that, that myelination becomes, or the myelinated sheath comes, the more embedded that neural pattern becomes. So imagine it starts off as nothing. When we start learning the skill, that myelin, myelinated sheath starts to thicken because we lay down strips for each time we're, we're practicing that movement pattern, and then we start to build robust skill movements, if we want to talk about our new movement patterns. So like when, you learn something for the first time, you do something new and it feels weird because you haven't like built that up and then when something starts to click and feels a bit more normal or people might say it feels natural now. Yeah, yeah you've exactly. You've been through that process and built that up. And we often talk about why it's easy for kids to, to, to learn skills. Well, they're, 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 the, the rate of how, how quickly that myelin develops in, in, in young children is rapid so they can pick up stuff. So if you want to learn something fast or you look at uh, uh, people that have learned things like People who have been gymnasts and learned to walk on their hands when they were five years old can probably still do it now. Yeah. They just got to optimize that development stage of their lives when they're exposed to a particular skill acquisition. Now, what does that mean for people of later generations and slightly older and longer people in that like yeah. us And you haven't done gymnastics. Yeah, exactly. So the pistol squat is about, and, and any skill acquisition, is about finding a number of different progressions which are going to help you to take that whole movement and break it down into bite-sized chunks. What are your thoughts on that around a pistol squat? Um, well, I'll just talk a little bit generically first, basing our theories around what the framework that we use at Scorecast is for any of our movements, that there's a, there's a movement aspect and there's a strength aspect. And so, like, we'll take the pistol squat then, like, have you got the hip and ankle mobility 
to be able to, to create the shape we need to in order that you don't just fall backwards on your yeah. on your um, when you go down to that bottom position. And if people want some more information about that, we've done a video, so you yeah, can go and check that out. Yeah, there's a two-part video to the business as well. Um, and then there's a case of are you strong enough to be able to control yourself down eccentrically, stabilise the bottom, and then have, have you got enough strength to come up concentrically? And some of the thing about learning the new movement, if we're talking about that as being the skill, is formulating some ways where you can um, work some exercises where you make the the whole movement easier for you to be able to give the brain a chance to, to learn that new movement skill or pattern so um, you might be you might jack your heel up so that you're able to get better door selection so you can hold that bottom that bottom position in your in your pistol squat or you're doing a ha learning hand standing and you're going to be against the wall so you don't have to worry too much about the balance, but you're being upside down and giving the brain that the whole movement that you're trying to do, but in an easier like environment, as it were, to yeah. be able to learn that. Yeah. Um, I think the pistol squat for me is it, it's an example of a, of a movement, but it's actually one the body's pretty comfortable with. Sort of a squatting based pattern. Yeah, we've over over the sort of years of what our modern day lifestyles look like, we've we've kind of jacked up the hips and the ankles. We've done quite a good job of, of messing up what we actually was a very good natural functional movement, but. We should be strong on one leg. The body knows that particularly, that particularly well. So if you can get the range of movement and the strength, you're probably not going to have a massively difficult time of sticking together a pistol squat. Yeah. What becomes much more difficult is like a human flag where you've got absolutely no history of doing a push-pull at maximal effort with straight arms extended overhead yeah. um, in any kind of previous training that you might have done. So that's a real opportunity where you're going to see what I'm talking about with that yeah. myelinated sheath where we have to learn from scratch. And the more we do it, the more we, we get that reinforcement of the movement pattern and we start to lay down a, yeah, a muscle activation sequence and some synchronization which means we can start to produce a movement. And it's all about little and often, that responds quite well. So we're doing skill, skill acquisition, we can get really good benefits from doing it regularly and quite remember consistently. Fresh as well. Yeah. Not doing it at the end of the session when you smash when you try to learn something. That's yeah, remember we try and train the neural system. We talk about fatigue quite generally, but the neural system gets, it gets tired, it gets fatigued. So doing things which are highly complex, new skills, do those at the beginning of the session. Work out what it is that you're wanting to work towards and get the progressions within that. We've done loads of videos if it's hand balancing, yeah. you can find some of our stuff on human flags and back levers, and that's what our whole process is, is like Jack referred to, and the framework is broken down into actually, we have a whole section called movement patterning as part of our, our um, framework, which is completely de designated to how we do skill acquisition. Yeah. So if there's something particularly you want to work on, Either have a look through what you can find on YouTube, as we've done quite a few videos on those, or check out the ebooks. Um, but feel free if you've got some more questions around a specific uh, movement, then yeah, stick a question yeah. and we'll see if we can just, for, if, just to finish off, because he asked, was asking specifically about that, about the pistol squat, and as Tim was describing, squatting pat movements or patterns in general, like we're quite used to, just reminds you, Tim's got a 10 week old uh, baby Jack, and he, although Essentially, Tim has been training him, but generally, like he's got a baby. Look at a baby; like they automatically have that squat pattern. Like they they can sit into a deep squat. So it's not that you need to look. You might need to relearn it, but it, it's there. As in terms of a, a in terms of a pistol squat, when you try and do it, it's going to feel impossible and looks a bit crazy when you see someone doing it dead easy. But that's only because you've got a load of junk in your ankle and your hips yeah. that stopped you from being able to do that thing. That actually, when you were there's not many things in life that you're better at when you're like 10 weeks old compared to when you're however yeah, old you are now but, you but squatting his, probably is one of those things <laughs> you should it? see his hip hinge like his hamstring length is his spinal cushion is beautiful yeah. it's a bit assisted at the moment but we're working on it <laughs> i like to think he's developing quite quickly yeah. <laughs> that's quite a long answer but there's a lot to it it's very complicated we'll yeah. come back to us if that's not quite clear but a great question yeah really good okay so question number two two have to Do ask it. the question oh, master. Sorry, question master. What is question number two? What is question number two, Tim, is uh, from Paul H. I don't know if that's his surname is like hate like Triple H. I think or sorry it's got it like it's just the initial. Um, again, off uh, YouTube. Um, he doesn't say like the last video, but he just says hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm struggling with the transition. It's a good one actually. It's something I've found very uh, takes a lot of time and, and works hard on. Uh, been through quite a bit of three struggles on this, um, but Tim is the master of his head of handstands. Um, I'm struggling with the transition between doing handstand push-ups against the wall and attempting them freestanding. Any advice appreciated? But I like to take a mentoring approach in my uh, in my role as head of handstands. So Dave, why don't you enlighten us as to what you've learned from your journey okay, into hand balancing? Well, so, 
They, but first and foremost, there is a huge difference between being supported against a wall uh, with your feet holding, supporting you, even though they're not helping you up, compared to being freestanding. So when you're freestanding, trying to do a handstand press up, you've got all of, it's like being able to do um, the difference between doing loads of dips on bars and trying to do dips on rings. And people really struggle to do dips on yeah. rings when they haven't done them before, because the stabilizing muscles around the shoulder don't know what the hell's going on when on that ring. And so the, the, the prime movers like the, your chest, your pecs, your, your, your triceps aren't able to even get going because the, the, the joint or the shoulder doesn't feel stable enough. Yeah. Um, so you can, might be able to bosh out 10 handstand push-ups with your feet against the wall you try to do on freestanding and your balance might be quite good but as soon as you start trying to move you don't feel like you've got the strength or the horsepower to get back up because you, you, you haven't upgraded the sort of uh, stabilising structures around the shoulder to be able to work um, work effectively and actually put down the strength you've got. The brain just like pulling back some of that strength that you've got so that it doesn't feel stable. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so there's a balance aspect of that. Like, I don't know what you're at, Paul H, whether you're like balance, are you really good at balancing or have you just done more handstand press-ups and actually you need to get good at balancing on your hands, that proprioception of, of, of balance through the fingers and that feedback through the hands and the fingers and then try and build that in together. Um, or are you just completely struggling with that? So yeah. I think that bang on. And I think the other thing is actually links back to what we talked about before is like handstand push-ups against the wall is an easier skill than a freestanding handstand push-up. So your ability to be able to apply force when that wall is not supporting you, you've got so many more variables that you're trying to control. So the skill component of how you actually control that movement, what your feet do, what you, what you, um, how does your body weight shift as you lower down yeah. towards the ground? Are you able to keep the feet in a position where you're then at the same time strong enough to hold that shape, which you don't have to worry about against the wall? Yeah. Or when you drop down, does the body angle change because you're losing some strength through that range, which then means you lose your balance? There's all of that yeah, sort of stuff going on. Uh, so I wanted to say something on that, as you were saying that there. When you're, if here's the wall, and your feet are up against, and, and, and against the wall, you've, all, you've, you've automatically got some like banana back yeah. issues going on, even if you've got it like minimal. But the, the difference being on your, when you're freestanding, as, you say, as Tim says, your body comes down and you actually angle your feet slightly behind you. It changes the, the mechanics of what's going on and where you actually, where you're pushing from a yeah. little bit. like. Um, and so it's something that I've helped to practice that um, and, and gave this one to Harvey, loved it, our camera and some bits of visuals, so he loved this one, where you go into that handstand uh, against the wall, you take your feet off and get your balance, and then you slowly just lower down into the control, so literally your nose touches the floor, hold that bottom position where your feet are slightly backwards of you and you have that little bit of angle because you come down forward slightly. You haven't gone straight down and put your head between your hands because your elbows are gonna flare out to the side and junk up that shoulder. You've come forward there. Um, and just and then just be able to control and feel that position and, and just doing uh, slow eccentrics of those so five seconds on the way down uh, minimum um, and not even doing a huge number of reps on that but just giving the brain a little bit like the first question giving the brain the opportunity to learn that movement and build up the strength through that eccentric and you get the control as well you'll soon be able to get back up and get that out position yeah I would also then practice the outward bit then still use the wall so go against uh, come up to the wall away from it control yourself lower down then as you come back up you should then come back up and find the wall again and then eventually take the wall out all together yeah spend some time this is hard right we're talking about freestanding handstand push-ups like that's a pretty advanced <laughs> yeah, yeah, skill yeah. that's yeah not to be sort of scoffed at and how difficult it is yeah. but it definitely use this system we call it about an assistance tool it's from our locker which kind of helps a little bit around meaning that we can train progressively um, use that to get your your body position right the strength should be there, but you've got to learn to apply that strength when you've got a whole heap more stability to contend with. Yeah. So use those eccentrics with your feet off the wall, yeah. that is mine. Play around with that one, great progression. Okay. Number three please David, question master. Third and final question is from Billy Dragon. And again, great. if that's his actual surname, how exciting. Um, not the capital D though. So I wish I I'd know. got a better alias, actually. You could change your name. Default. Think of a good one. Um, you've got a good one, so stick in the comments. <laughs> Very insightful session, enjoyed it. So that's the previous Q&A, you did. Jack uh, and I like positive <laughs> feedback. Uh, question for you both. Oh, yeah, this is a great question, Dragon. Can I call you Dragon, is that all right? <laughs> um, name five <coughs> mistakes you made when you started calisthenics. Keep up the great Thank work, you. guys. Smiley face. Tim, you gotta go for five. five. I've been thinking about it. I've done a blog, actually, about the 10 mistakes, like not to make or something like that, that's on the website. But um, 
that was a couple of months ago and now probably as I'm getting older and more experienced I think my top five are going to change a little bit I am I'm going to flip this because when I thought about this question right. um, I do the five best things no I think I've made more mistakes since starting calisthenics than when I first began so I actually think when, when Jack you made more I, mistakes now than you did at the beginning yeah okay. and I'll tell you why I'll tell you for why tell us enlighten us Tim <laughs> I might not have got five but I'm going to I'm going to wax lyrical for a minute about this um when Jack and I first started training calisthenics, we knew training because we were strength and conditioning coaches working with, with athletes, so we knew what the training environment looked like. We didn't know anything about calisthenics, and there wasn't a lot of people providing particularly progressive and systematic training. That's why we developed what we developed through the why school, we because the school. we started bringing those two things together. However, we just went in the gym and we messed about, yeah. and we had a lot of fun. And people, to the point where people say to us, they go, what are you boys doing in the gym? Because it just looks like you're messing about. And we were like, yeah, we are. We're, we're messing about. But we used to go in the gym. The gym was just across the road. And we would, like, try and balance on things on our hands. We would just, like, <laughs> hang off stuff. Can you do that? I don't know. Can I do that? I'll try it. See if I can do it. And, like, rate of progression was massive. Now, this is, this is all actually tied together really nice. Skill acquisition stuff, we were learning new skills. We were learning to move in new That's ways. One of that sort new. of got us addicted to it, didn't it? Because it was that new yeah. stuff. So we played, and then we did a lot of basic strength work. So we were doing a lot of dips, a lot of pull-ups push-up variations and we did more of that sort of stuff because partly we couldn't really do a lot else so we just did a lot of that and as we've gone through stuff I think I've overcomplicated it at times and knowledge is, is, is power in that we know a lot about training and we understand a lot about how we can adapt the variables but it also can provide a really cloudy approach to training and especially when we throw work and general fatigue and we travel a lot so we're all over the place and, and the consistency of I don't have a job that I finish at nine o'clock or five o'clock in the afternoon. I go to the gym every day and I can do this sort of yeah. stuff. We have to fit it all in. So things become really kind just of like, messy. Just like, yeah, just, yeah, like everybody does. So the mistake I think when, when, when I'm going with this is I don't concentrate enough on basic strength, which is what I'm doing now, trying to get strong. Yeah, so that's one. I try and do too many things at the same time where I should actually just focus in on achieving something and moving forwards with it. The real. I think one of the mistakes is at one point I realized that I thought I could keep all of those plates spinning at the same time. So why can't I learn a front lever and a muscle up and a handstand and a human flag at the same time? I've got four different training sessions, so I'm just gonna do one each day, sometimes multiples. The neural system, again, we go back to that, can't hack it. And the stuff that you have to embed around those skills, the specific strength that's required, needs repetition. Yeah. If you're doing something different every day, you're never really kind of putting it through. If we, were, if we were going to take an athlete and go, right, we need to improve 10 meter sprint time. We'd be looking to do some lower body power based or strength based sessions, maybe three, four sessions a week and, and hitting some variations, but the same kind of stuff yeah. and hitting that over and over and over again. Whereas if I go to the gym, Monday's pull up day, I'm trying to work on my muscle up, but I'm not training the same things. Um, that's three, give me a break and you can have a go. <laughs> I might finish off with two others in a minute. So, so I, I echo those statements definitely. Um, one thing I've never, never been good at was I was never patient enough. Yeah. Was one thing. So I would, and this is a mistake, but it's something that's, um, it's something that's helped me be a better coach. I think in the I should be. I say this now. I've saying this a few times to people. Doing calisthenics, based about three years. Um, and even at the start, so it was finished rugby, it was, wanted to carry on training, loved training, lifting weights, got bored lifting weights quite quickly when no game to play at the weekend or whatever. So got into car tennis, Tim was messing about a bit, and like I said, we were just messing about basically. And I was actually still lifting some weights that time, because I thought if I, if I stopped lifting weights then I'd lose all my size and didn't want to get small, um, which was obviously wrong. Um, and I would always be trying to do stuff that's way too difficult for me. That was what that was definitely a mistake in terms of my pressure. So I feel like you still do that now. Th yeah, that's what I'm saying. So <laughs> three years, in three years, I should be better at calisthenics than I am now. But I don't. But I feel like I'm a better coach hmm. because I've made like loads. I know the pitfalls and mistakes that everyone else is going to go yeah. through. Um, like my hand, like my handstand mistake of spending too long early doors kicking up and being way further behind on my handstand development than you, but then being able to then 
figure out finding that transition yeah, out of that yeah, frog stand is so much more difficult. I've tried everything under the sun and figured out actually what works and what doesn't work and what's effective in that. There's so, stuff on that, the evidence of that is like, Jack would be like, how do you do that movement where you just come out there? And I was like, I don't know, just kind of do it. Whereas you've actually had to go back and, and, and understand and figure it out. what yeah. is it that I did that was different where I just kind of did it and, yeah. and don't have as much of a probably coaching back or understanding as, as a detail of that because it came quite naturally. Yeah. So patience and not. So patience being one, another one being don't try and do stuff that's too hard for you. Um, but at the same time, you got to. Enjoy, I liked. I liked that challenge of doing crazy yeah. stuff, and I potentially nearly broke my back when I landed on that. Oh, that was a mistake. But yeah, that was being trying to do some hand standing stuff that I wasn't good enough to do. Well, we, had, was no, it that. Like, we had the gym. Did, we, didn't have any, we didn't have any kit at the gym, so we were learning to hand stand on farmers' walk bars. And if you know what they are they've got pylons where you put the weights on. So we were using those as parallel bars and it sounds ridiculous now. We yeah. definitely suggest that you don't do that because Chaco landed toppled over and it literally could have broken his spine. It was yeah. quite a hair raising moment for us. Um, so I think my progress, my personal progress has been slower because of that, but I think it's helped me be a better coach, which for me and what we're doing with the school, I'm really quite happy. I'm, I'm happy, I'd prefer it to be that way around. Yeah. I'd hate for us to be be able to do way more stuff but I can't teach anyone how to do it because yeah. I get the massive someone was asking I was on speaking to someone um, on the phone yesterday about the calisthenics and asking about they, they were even saying do you, do you like it when you're at the workshops coaching I was like we, we finished yeah. the workshop it's like buzzing because people are getting such a kick out of like seeing everybody else go through that thing we've done like doing something new for the first time and really getting a, a kick out of training enjoying their training loving their training and not um not not hating training but just knowing it's good for you to stay fit and healthy yeah, yeah. but actually really enjoying what we do i think that there's there's something in that guys is like we, we genuinely four things between us yeah i know i think we've done all right there i think um we genuinely are passionate about sharing this information with you and that's why we started this school because we were we were in the same place as a lot of you guys are it was just there wasn't a resource so the mistakes that we made we've packaged that even knowing what we know yeah. about how to train athletes yeah. You actually can avoid a heap of those. If yeah. you follow the blog information that we put out, we're not, we're not trying to like, like sugarcoat anything. We'll literally tell you we are two extra players trying to learn calisthenics. These are what we've missed. These are mistakes we've known, but yeah. the benefit that we have is we can come through that because we actually can apply it to a bit of training sites. If you think you can't do it, you, and, and you, sometimes people look at others now and go, oh, you've always been able to do that. Yeah. It's like, no, I haven't. Or, oh, well, I've got this wrist injury. And it's like, well, yeah, like Tim dislocated shoulder, I've broken my scapula, I've broken my thumb, I've broken mm. my wrist, I've snapped tendons here, like my hands are awful for like hand balance, but you'll find a way. Like we work with people that don't have an arm or don't have a leg or like with, with the Paralympic stuff we do, like you can, don't think that it's not for you or you can't do yeah. it just because something's difficult because the rewards are there to be had. I'm going to wrap up. I've got one more. Go on. Right. Oh, this would be amazing if it's the same thing. One, two, three. I didn't do enough stretching and mobility work. Oh, I was going to say, I was going <laughs> to oh. say. Well, let's let know that I. We get, um, we get a bonus one. one then. But you're high from mobile, so you. No, but we we, we completely overloaded tendons in, in the upper body because yes. you trained so regularly. Ah, so it does the same as mine, because mine was didn't have enough rest. Oh. So I'd literally like hey. train every day or try to train every day and then wonder why. It come, right, I've been training now for three weeks and I've now worse at <laughs> yeah. like whatever it is. Like, I'm trying to do weight issues. I could do 30 kilo chins. Like two weeks ago, now I can only do 25. Like, how am I weaker? Yeah. And then you're not weaker, you're just tired. You're just tired, you're knackered. <laughs> yeah. So then it'd be like, oh, my flag feels terrible. But yeah, well, because you had not rested. Cause yeah, yeah. So rest, 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 build and in this, rest days. And, this, and be progressive. I actually am a victim of this this week, a really nice little example. So I'm doing some more front lever work. Uh, I'm starting to do some more work on my, on my back lever with the palms um, down towards the ground. And that's, that's actually gone and put a heap more tension through my elbow. So I woke up the following day and I've got elbow niggles and I know what it feels like now. I've got another one. So, the, um, so my first go-to after that was I went in, I got some time in the gym, spent some time loosening off and then went into a corrective strategy. So well, I actually want to do a video on this one because it's a really yeah. useful one because it's fixed it in a day. It's just starting to understand how the wrist and the elbow works and why that's starting to kick off because if you ignore that niggle, I promise you, I was having a great chat with physio good. about elbows be a combination of muscular and neural impingements and get all sorts of issues going to go on if you go down that route because you don't rest enough and you don't do enough mobility work and it is the same thing yeah you're going to have problems so prioritize that that is probably the number one because it halts your training and it's it's a really you have to be strict with yourself because you want to train but actually the best thing for you is to give at least some of that time pre and post yeah 
to mobilization and that again fits into our sort of our preparation phase and yeah. taking care of your body because what we're doing is high demand and you're not accustomed and trained to it because yeah. unless you've done a lot of hanging stuff ligaments and tendons and connected tissue it takes a long time to adapt so just thinking you can do five, you used to do five days a week bodybuilding thinking you can do five days a week calisthenics from yeah, a beginner's a level is completely loading. different ball game um, which my, last one my, then yeah and it links into that nicely um, was like listen to your body yeah. but I didn't listen to my body so, and I'd know like there'd be that voice going like why are you still doing that like, like you're, you've got that elbow pain but you're just going to carry on doing that exercise that you know hurts it yeah. rather than actually figuring out what was the problem sorting it out giving it some rest and then coming back we actually get um, quite a lot of questions coming about injuries should I do this if I've got a slip disc should I do that yeah. the, the flat answer to that is if you've got anything which you're concerned about like we can't diagnose or anything like that go and see physical. people get someone yeah. get some support it's worth the investment yeah. and the last thing I'm going to say is you do that around like training through injuries often because yeah. I'm trying to keep up with Jacko we were training together yeah, yeah, yeah. and like oh Tim is doing that today so we want to train together we're going to do that yeah. sometimes you've got to take your own little path and yeah, that's mix it great. good wow Exhausted. Oh, that was a great. Yeah, a lot there Number today. Three was Amazing. A good one, was it? Right. If uh, if you've oh, got questions, no, yeah, you, no, you've I've got questions yeah. for for um, for Q and A number four. The next one. Comment below. Um, if you haven't yet subscribed, make sure you click that over there. These ones always come on my face. I'm just going <laughs> to sit here today. You get like a there'll be a thumb over my it's face. It's like a floating head. We've got a free beginner's guide, which we'd love to give you if you haven't yet got started. And that is down there. Uh, you get that from the website. It's free. There's no just download it there's no reason why you wouldn't pull it to us and Tim's leaning over because there's one over here that's going to be uh, last week's Q&A in case you missed it I don't it. like it when it's on my face it's just my shoulders and I'm sat there like looking like a right lemon finish yourself <laughs> nothing but sales to say today there's knowledge bombs in there so till next time class dismissed <laughs>